Reverend Sam Adeyemi is the founder and senior pastor of Daystar Christian Center, Nigeria. Daystar is one of the largest churches in Africa, having grown from only a few people since its birth in 1995 to now over 20,000 members. A highly sought after conference speaker, Sam Adeyemi has impacted millions of people around the world. He is known for teaching practical biblical principles that help people succeed and become role models in every area of their lives. He is also the host of the popularly known motivational program, Success Power, which airs on radio and television stations in Europe, Africa, and the United States. Sam Adeyemi's writings have gone on to be published in newspapers and magazines worldwide, and he has authored numerous books, including the bestsellers, Parable of the Dollar, Success is Who You Are, Second Revolution, and Ideas Rule the World. Ladies and gentlemen, give a resounding welcome to Reverend Sam Adeyemi. Let's go ahead, Reverend Sam. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, my dear Pastor Tola. Thank you. I celebrate you. I celebrate God's grace on your life. I thank you for your friendship and for your love. I celebrate Pastor Kofo too, and your whole family. Well, I celebrate everyone at Jesus House Baltimore, and I am especially excited to be a part of the Great Leadership Conference. Wow. So, see, Pastor Tola and I share this passion for leadership good leadership and right now there's just this huge need for good leadership in our world. So our theme for this conference is structuring and restructuring. Okay, so um, I am sharing this evening on creating and sustaining, uh, creating structures for success, okay? Creating structures, okay? Structures for creating and sustaining success. Um, I'm gonna share my slide, okay? I'm gonna share my slide, but just before I do, I have a gift uh, just in case um, somebody is interested, the team can help me to maybe display the link. So I have a link and it's a free offer. Okay. Free offer to the replace of a three day challenge that I had recently leadership movement challenge. I called it from my experience. I have come to realize that if you are going to be able to influence people on a mass scale, or if you're going to be able to build a successful organization in the first place, you need to build your own leadership movement, literally. If you're going to be able to run a family that will add value to our world, right? Build your own leadership movement. Make your family a leadership movement, so to speak. Only God knows where those children are going to get to. Only God knows who's going to be a president tomorrow, who's going to be a governor, who's going to be a CEO. Only God knows who's going to be a teacher affecting people's lives from a young age, who's going to be a pastor. Only God knows. So what I then discuss is my framework, how it worked for me up until this point. Now, some people are paying money to get it, but I'm offering it free. 30 days access. After 30 days, it will be disabled. Okay, it won't work anymore. So you won't be able to watch the replays, but they're very powerful. Each day is about one and a half hours. Okay, powerful, powerful leadership stuff. All right, good. Um, so you just copy the link and uh, you'll be instructed on what to do next. Good. So let me share my screen share my slide. Awesome. Here we go. Ah, creating and sustaining structures for success. 
creating and sustaining structures for success. Let me start from here. Um, I got to learn about the systems in an interesting way. It was from a friend, a friend's experience. Now you must have heard people say experience is the best teacher. And these days we add as long as it is not your own experience. So my friend, I mean, who is, is a member of our church and he's been my friend for more than 30 years. <laughs> so in those early years of our church, he was also, while I was <laughs> working hard by the grace of God to build our church, he was also working hard to build his businesses. And it was hard, you know, it was hard. He used to drive around uh, this van, this Pojo van uh, that, you know, his father left because it, his father passed on early. This van was old. I mean, he would be driving on the streets of Lagos and he would be seeing the road from inside the car, okay? <laughs> and there was a day we ended the service in church and I saw how he was starting the car. He had to open the front, right? The engine cover, we call it the bonnet. He had to open it, go inside, connect some wires, then bring a spanner, touch something in the engine before the car started. And anyway, so this particular day, he was driving on one of the major roads in Lagos. He said, all of a sudden, the road turned upside down. <laughs> he panicked. I'm sure you know what the issue was. The problem was not with the road. <laughs> it was him. The road turned upside down, he said. So he just slammed on the brakes right in the middle of the road. Jumped out of the car, you know, and other cars were, were going past. He jumped out of the car, pulled, out, pulled off his tie, removed his shoe because he was scared. He knew something was going seriously wrong health-wise. Anyway, eventually people gathered and all that. He calmed down. Then he was able to drive gently to his uncle's house, which was not far away. And then later he saw a doctor. The doctor checked everything and said, oh, well, physically speaking, there's nothing wrong with you. So that means that your illness is psychosomatic. He said that word itself scared him. He said your illness is psychosomatic. You're stressed, mister, you're stressed. I am banning you from moving around. <laughs> You're going to stay in your house until I give you the permission to get out of the house. And uh, he owned a bookshop, you know, so he just told his staff to give him a supply of books. And he was reading and reading while he was there. So he told me about the book that he read, The Cash Flow Quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki. When I got a copy, then I got to understand what he was talking about because in the cash flow quadrant, Robert Kiyosaki describes four ways in which you make money. We earn money by being employees, that's the E quadrant. We earn money by being, uh, sorry, by being um, employees. Yes, that's the E quadrant. Or by being self-employed, that's the S quadrant. Or by being business owners, that's the B quadrant or by being investors, that's the I quadrant. So, of course, immediately I was puzzled by self-employed and business because it said the self-employed person is the person who's running the business, but it's only that person, you know, that is in the employment of the business. Robert Kiyosaki then explained that the difference between the two, the self-employed person and the business owner is systems. So what we're discussing is really important, okay? Really important. When I got to understand it, honestly, it, it was a game changer. For my friend, it was, and for me, it was. Because my friend 
you, you know, it was the one that told me and eventually I saw it in the book. Robert Kiyosaki said, look, try and draw the organizational chart for your organization, okay? Create all those boxes, right? For the CEO, the head of this, head of that, head of this, head of that. Then try and fill the names of the people that occupy all those positions. And he said, the problem with the self-employed person is you will then find out you're the one occupying all those boxes. So my friend said, when he did that, he saw why he was killing himself. Because how would you be the CEO and be the head of finance and be the head, head of sales and marketing and be the head of production and be the head of this and the head of that? And apart from the head, then you are the manager, this, and then you are the um, whatever, <laughs> executive officer, that, and all that, you know? So that's why I got to appreciate the value of systems. And Robert Kiyosaki said, for the self-employed person, you dare not go on vacation. Your income will go on vacation. But for the person that has built systems, even while you are sipping pina colada on the beach in Cancun, right, or somewhere else, you are still making money because you are leveraging other people's time and energy. I just wanted to bear that in mind as we discuss structures today, okay? So, what is a structure? A structure is a system that shows the distribution of roles and activities towards the achievement of the objectives of an organization, okay? A system that shows the distribution of roles and activities towards the achievement of the objectives of an organization. So when you look at the structure, you know who does what, <laughs> you know, which department does what, okay? Right. To build structures, you need to be clear about your vision and your goals. Just think of a building, for example, when you think structure, just picture a building in your mind. And you know that before you build anything, you've got to have a blueprint. You've got to have a clear idea of what you want to build. Is it you know, a block of condos, you know, or, or terraced houses, or uh, semi-detached family homes, you know, or a single family home? You've got to have a vision of what you want to build, right? You describe that to the architect, the architect produces a blueprint. Then you can construct the structures. So to build structures anyway, you've got to be clear about your vision and your goals for your organization. You've got to have a vision. And I say that a vision is, that vision is the ability to see people, places, and things, not just the way they are or the way they could be. That's true for the building, isn't it? Yeah, it's also, built, it's also true for organizations. Okay, so be clear. Be clear about where you're going. Be clear about when you want to get there. Be clear about what the milestones are going to be, okay? To build structures, you've got to be clear about your vision and goals. And to build structures, you need to be a systems thinker. Now, this is big. You need to be a systems thinker. Uh, on this point, I would like to use the human body for illustration. See, the human body runs on systems, right? Excretory system, reproductive system, respiratory system, right? The nervous system, systems. And the system is a group of parts that carry out a specific function. So when you say respiratory system, that's from the nose, you know, down to the windpipe and the lungs, whatever takes in oxygen and takes it out and takes out carbon dioxide. That's that all those parts together form a system. So when I say that you need to be a systems thinker, this is what I mean. Most people 
cannot think beyond a part, part time. So it's either they're thinking nose, or they're thinking lungs, you know, or they're thinking trough, or <laughs> trachea, or windpipe, part time. But when you're able to go beyond one path, one path, okay, to everything that works together to carry out a particular function, it's a big shift. Honestly, it's a big shift, okay? Then, you know, when you're a systems thinker, not only will you be able to think of the respiratory system, you, you then see how the respiratory system works with the other systems in the body, right? To make the whole body to function. Honestly, this dimension of thinking determines how high you rise. Because the major difference between, let's say, a clerk and the CEO is perspective. What they are seeing is different. What the CEO is seeing is more composite. It's more wholesome. So I'll tell you that as you develop the capacity to think in whole like that, not only in parts, honestly, the likelihood that you will rise is high. To build structures, you need to be a systems thinker. Let's move on. The benefits of having a structure. One, it shows the flow of communication. And in this instance, we're talking about an organization, right? It shows how communication flows in an organization. You know, at the end of the day, <laughs> what really makes an organization is not the buildings or the equipment, it's the people in the organization. What makes a nation is more than just the geography, it's the people in the nation, right? So it's the relationships, it's the connections between the people that really determine how successful we are in building and running an organization, a business, a, a church, a ministry. And the lifeblood of all relationships is communication. So a structure helps you to see clearly who, you know, is talking to who, if you want to talk to somebody about something, who you should talk to. And then a structure increases efficiency and effectiveness. So it, it limits waste, so to speak. You are able to achieve more with little. Just think of the fact that you're going to waste resources if you're trying to get results from a department, for example, that has no business doing <laughs> what you want done, or you're trying to get a staff member to do something that the person has no business doing because it's not part of their job description, right? So it increases efficiency. Um, one of the things I, I had to share, you know, in, in with our staff in their staff was on how to get people to do things, how to get your work done. Because I saw a lot of conflict where people would cut across departments, you know? Yeah, their work has brought them together, okay? Or at least it's connected in some way. Somebody needs to get something done. And the person that needs to get it done in another department is a peer, for example. And then they want the job done, the person is not doing it because it's not the person's priority. And I say, look, use the system, use the structure, right? Leverage the structure. Instead of passing, you know, the request direct to someone who is at the same level with you, why don't you pass it up to your own boss, the head of your department? Let it pass to the head of the person's department. By the time it comes down, it's an instruction. <laughs> It's not a request, it's an instruction and it becomes priority. But the likelihood is while you're sending the request to the person, the person also has loads of assignments from uh, you know, superior officers and those ones will be priority. Okay, so that's, I'm just trying to illustrate how having a structure, working with it increases efficiency and increases effectiveness. It helps us to uh, make optimal use of our resources, human, material, financial. It also helps faster growth. That's what I mean by effectiveness. Uh, having a structure creates culture. Ah, culture. 
culture, that powerful word that literally, literally determines whether an organization will succeed or fail. Culture, the, the, the way we do things that has been adapted and cultivated over time in the process of solving problems and resolving issues. Humans, we humans are creatures of habit. When we've done something consistently over some time, it becomes second nature. We don't even need to think deeply about it. Those things that people do are second nature. Those are the things that really drive an organization. And if you want to carry out any change until you dig down to that level, most change efforts don't succeed. I'm saying here that when you build a structure, you're controlling behavior. And once people repeat that behavior over and over and over and over again, it becomes habit, it becomes culture in the organization. So I'm in a building now, right? Just like you are. And I'm in a room and there's a door. That structure that has determined where the walls will be, where the window will be, and where the door would be has already dictated my behavior. I've never climbed out of this room before through the window. And I won't even bother going through the wall, right? <laughs> Until I develop that kind of anointing. You want to change my behavior? You don't want me to go out through, you know, the door is to my right here now. If you don't want me to go there anymore, then just put a wall there and open up a door to my left. You automatically change my behavior. So whenever you want to change behavior in an organization, you know, pay attention to the culture, tweak it. Uh, having a culture, uh, having a structure increases clarity on roles and reporting lines. Who is in charge of what? You know, it increases clarity on roles and reporting lines. Uh, resources are focused, leading to better productivity. Absolutely. Um, resources are focused, lead, leading to better productivity. Gardeners don't leave trees to grow in every direction. It never works. And that's what uh, Jesus was describing in John 15, right? John 15. So I, I am the vine. My father is the gardener, he said. The tree that bears fruit, he talked about how he attends to it. The one that does not bear fruit, he cuts it out. That's the development of structure and the directing of resources to the most productive parts. That's what structure, you use structure to do. Direct the flow of resources for better productivity. And the building of a structure is a critical requirement for most startups to negotiate the shift from the startup to the expansion phase. This is huge. You know, most small businesses die. Most startups die. And I'll tell you, one of the major reasons is the inability to shift from the startup phase to the expansion phase. When you start, if you're really providing value and people are happy with you, if you're providing value, people are happy with you, word of mouth will help you. <laughs> if you're a fashion designer, for example, people will see whatever it is that you made on, on, on your customers and they'll ask, who made that for you? That's what I'm talking about. You get referrals, your clientele base increases. Um, do you realize that's where many people begin to falter? That's where many people begin to falter, okay? So if you get the startup phase right, and you get it right when uh, the value you're providing and customers meet, and maybe your passion also comes into the mix. If those three meet at the same point, boom, <laughs> right? then the demand increases, okay? Demand increases. 
And then many people begin to fail. They begin to disappoint their clients. They begin to give excuses because they don't know what to do. And what's simply happening is that the organization is demanding for more resources than one person can provide. The structure must come in at that point. <laughs> we will have to divide the job at that point. Delegation needs to come in at that point, right? So when you develop that capacity to build a structure, I'm saying that it helps you to create that shift, you know, from that startup phase to the expansion phase. So you're able to take advantage of those great opportunities that are coming. And of course, you keep tweaking the structure then to allow for expansion as you move on. Not having a structure increases confusion with expansion. It increases confusion. If you're trying to grow, you're trying to expand without structure, you have a problem. You remember, you know, Acts chapter six in the Bible. Okay, so on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people uh, committed their lives to Christ. 3,000. And then you get to, that was Acts chapter two, you get to Acts chapter three, um, at the gate called Beautiful and Solomon's Porch, another 5,000. That was a, that was a boom, right? That startup phase worked. <laughs> the power of the Holy Spirit provided great value, right? And the church also was distributing food. That's important. So you remember the first crisis? It had to do with food distribution. People don't understand how powerful it is to meet basic needs in the society. Anyway, once they got that right, so they, they, they had more people. They had so many people, but there wasn't enough structure or order. So there was complaining. Some people were complaining the food did not get to them. If you've been to many wedding receptions in Nigeria, like I have, you will understand what I'm talking about, right? How food can get to some parts, <laughs> some people, and food will not get to some people, right? And some people can even have spare to take home. When you don't have a good structure, that is what happens. And you remember how they resolved the problem. Yeah, the apostles said, hmm, we've got to stay with strategy, big vision, hearing from God, saying what God said, because that's the core value that we have to add here. The, we should not leave that to serve tables. Let's appoint seven men. And they did. So they created another layer of leadership. That was structuring, right? And you get the result in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. The word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. When you don't have structure, reporting lines are not clear. Division of labor, not clear. That increases in efficiency because you, you are not even assigning people to the best places right, where they can serve. Uh, choosing the structure, therefore, is a critical decision for organizational leaders. And the wrong choice of structure can lead to a loss of opportunities. So the structure of an organization can either be centralized or decentralized. Now, most organizations have a centralized structure, uh, which means that the command and control comes from the top. From the executive, but when a structure is decentralized, it means that the operating units have autonomy. So power is delegated, you know, to those operating units, and they can make many decisions without referring to headquarters. Structure pictured as an organizational chart should align with the goals of the organization, it's very important. So we're not creating a structure for the sake of creating a structure. Um, the kind of structure should depend on what the vision and the goals of your own organization are, right? That's why the structure of a church will likely be different from the structure of a manufacturing company, for example, okay? Now the goals depend on the level of effectiveness and efficiency needed for the organization to succeed. This is what I mean by effectiveness. 
uh, expansion, growth, okay? Uh, the products and services that you offer, how they get to the customer, okay? To ensure they are satisfied and how you expand the market, increase the number of customers. Efficiency, on the other hand, is the smooth running of the organization to ensure optimum use of resources. You want to use the least amount of money to achieve your objectives. You want to use the least number of people to achieve your objectives. You want to use the least uh, number of equipment, okay, to achieve your resources because you want to save money and you want to save time, okay? So we classify organizational goals generally under those two, and we compare the two. Let me give you a pictorial idea of what I mean. So for some organizations, they need a high level of efficiency, okay? That's sound use of <laughs> resources, and that usually requires expertise, a high level of skill. Some organizations don't need that at a high level to succeed. Effectiveness, on the other hand, on the hand, some need a high level of it to succeed. Some really don't need a high level of, of it to succeed. So you can practically position every organization in any of the four quadrants that we're looking at. Some organizations with a low level of efficiency and a low level of effectiveness they can still be successful. And that's usually where there is monopoly. <laughs> there isn't competition. You can't try that where there's competition, right? But where there is no competition, there's monopoly, you can, you can do anything you like. But these are usually government, right? <laughs> government corporations. And if you come from Africa, you understand what I'm talking about. Okay. Some organizations need a high level of efficiency, but with low level of effectiveness, they can still succeed. Some need a high level of effectiveness that's growth, pursuing expansion, like uh, technology companies, for example, because of the rate of innovation in the organization, they have to be on their feet and keep running and moving. And sometimes that's, if they're not very big with a low level of efficiency, they can still be successful. But if they're big, then you may need high level of efficiency and high level of effectiveness. That's another quadrant there, good. So let's discuss the types of structure and we'll discuss them along the lines of those four quadrants, right? Good. The first one is the simple structure. It's simple. It's good for startups and small organizations. You have the owner or manager and you have one or two or three people reporting to them. Okay. So these would easily fall on the, okay, let, let, let's, describe their characteristics for the simple structure, right? Anybody can do that, right? That's why you should start up as a startup, right? It has an executive and other individuals. The executive does the visioning and coordination and is the main contact with suppliers and customers and clients, <laughs> right? So in terms of getting business, winning customers, the executive usually is the one that does, the person just passes instructions down to the people, let's say at the corner shop. So like I said earlier on, it can succeed, just corner shop, right? With a low level of effectiveness and a low level of efficiency, right? Um, it's also low on product group customer orientation. You know, in other words, most times they just stay at the shop, right? It's not like they're chasing customers around, going from house to house, stay in the shop. So it can be low on products for customer orientation and it can be low on specialization. Because like I said, if you're going to achieve a high level of efficiency, then you need expertise. You need professionalism. Uh, um, the finance needs to be un, you know, handled by a CPA, needs to be handled by you know, someone who is a qualified accountant, get what I mean, right? Uh, human resources management, you need an HR person, highly skilled. 
So, but for the simple structure, so the person who is working in the corner shop, yeah, if you employ someone, right, you own the corner shop, you employ someone, you notice usually they don't need to be highly skilled. So that's a simple structure. Let's move on to the functional structure. Most organizations use this structure. Okay, so you have the top management and the job is clearly divided. Most people, if you want to be able to run a large organization successfully, most people need to do this. Production department, sales and marketing department, finance department, HR department, right? So you have, so it's hierarchical. So you have the head of the department, then you have people in arranged in hierarchy beneath that person. So the organization's total task is broken into departments populated by skilled professionals. There's a hierarchy that operates with rules and policies. So usually you have laid down rules <laughs> for operating. For each of those boxes, you have a job description so that each person knows exactly what their own job is supposed to be. Uh, it is usually high on efficiency. Remember, you have experts here. You have highly qualified people here, usually high on efficiency, but low on effectiveness. So there are some organizations, some businesses uh, that will thrive with this. Let's say a lab, for example, a lab. So a lab needs qualified people, right? Needs technicians, skilled people. Okay, but then it may not necessarily be chasing, you know, people around town to come and do COVID tests <laughs> or some other kind of test, right? So it can be low on the effectiveness market expansion side and still be successful because people are going to come anyway, because for some of them, it's actually referral, let's say from the hospitals, guaranteed. So with just one, two, or three hospitals referring people, sometimes they're oversubscribed. And then this kind of a structure is high on functional specialization. That's what I call professionalism and skill. Functional specialization, low on products through customer orientation. Let's move on. The divisional structure. The divisional structure. This works for organizations with simple products or services and that have a widespread, let's say the business is spread across cities or the business, you know, is spread, spread across nations. Aha. So you have the headquarters and you have the top management, but then you have branches, okay? So you have um, branch one, they could even be within the same city, right? Branch one, branch two, branch three. So for each branch, there's a branch manager, right? And then you have the simple or functional structure under each branch. So let's discuss some of the characteristics. The focus is more on products and services and how to get them to more and more customers. See? Um, so this, this, the focus here is more on expansion, expansion, <laughs> expansion. The subunits and their managers are more independent and headquarters just gives them targets. So if it's a business, for example, if it's a business, then it's usually financial, okay? <laughs> the targets are usually financial. If it's a church, for example, maybe the number of souls to be won or it grows, grow the church to this number or plant these branches or so on. Uh, the subunits may have simple or functional structures, okay, depending on their sizes. And they're usually high on effectiveness and low on efficiency, okay? So when growth and expansion is more of the priority like that, then the efficiency parts, the running of the systems and structures may just not be strong, right? Let's move on to, and then it says, oh yes, it's high on products for customer orientation. Mm -hmm. New people, new people, new people, <laughs> or new customers. 
but usually low on functional specialization. So the fourth one um, for the fourth quadrant is the matrix structure. The matrix structure. This is good for an organization that requires both functional specialization and also has a wide spread in terms of growth. It's the most complex structure, as you can imagine, because you are chasing growth at, this, at the same time as you are chasing efficiency. Woo. <laughs> so, so here, you know, the professionals, at, you know, at the professional level, you address the finance, address the HR, address the production, sales and marketing, and they relate at the same level of quality with all the subunits. So that's why we, we are describing here the subunits as region one, region two, region three, region four, okay, which could be within the same city, could be within the same nation, could be global, right? Let's describe some of the characteristics here. Uh, the potential for conflict is high and it requires a high level of information flow. You know, was when I got to understand this, that we got to understand what was going on in Desta, for example, you know, <laughs> why we had so many conflicts. Yeah, they were not personal, but they could easily degenerate into personal issues because somebody just wonders, well, why do you keep, <laughs> you know, why do you keep, you know, um, picking on me or something like that. You, you, you think, what did I do to this guy? Yet, excellence is one of our core values in this stuff. So you're trying to achieve high level of quality. Hmm. So like we said, here, the potential for conflict is high. So conflict management is something you have to do regularly because you know how it is, just natural that people should want to protect their part of the job first. But then no job is done in isolation. It's depending on what somebody else is doing. If the person is not doing whatever they're supposed to do right, it's affecting your job. Your job is affecting somebody else's job right. So you have that tension. To, re to minimize the potential for conflict, there's, there's need for a high level of information flow. High level of information flow. The likelihood that whatever it is you're doing, the decision you are making is affecting somebody else is very high. Okay, the likelihood is very high. So, how did we resolve this at this time? Um, we found out we were dealing when it comes to communication and information flow. We we're dealing with a cultural issue. This was Africa, right? And communication is largely aura, face to face. If you come from the culture that I come from <laughs> in Nigeria, we say Ojulorowa, the communication is face to face, right? We then found out when, whenever we're trying to track issues, there was no basis for tracking. There, there were no records. So somebody says, oh, I told so and so person, the person says, you never told me nothing. They say, oh, but <laughs> you remember the conversation we had, right? At the lobby, the guy said, I can't remember, no lobby anywhere, okay? <laughs> you never told me anything. And with that, you find it difficult to hold anybody responsible for anything. So we have to encourage written communication. Face-to-face -face is still always the best, or you speak on the phone, but right after you've discussed this follow-up with the written one, that one doesn't change, right? Secondly, something important we, that we did, we said, just think of every possible person that this issue may affect copy them. They don't need to reply you. They don't need to say anything, but the knowledge of the decision you are making will help them to adjust on their side. And if it's going to affect them adversely, they can quickly bring that to your attention, which will improve the quality of your decision, right? A change at one point likely has a ripple effects across the system. That's what I was describing. Top management relies on managers heading functional and divisional units to manage operations. It's difficult to micromanage here. 
if you are at the top of the structure, you, that's why you need a high level of efficiency. You need highly qualified people. You delegate to them, you know, and they do the operations. When this structure is not run well, there's waste of time and money. There's low employee morale. People will be discouraged after some time. And then there's overload of decisions for top management. Overload of decisions. If the people handling the subunits don't have high capacity and they're not highly skilled and they're not stopping the ball. Because of the complexity of this structure, a lot of things will just rush at the people at the top. All right. So let me add some closing thoughts here. Because this is, as you can see, this is a sophisticated <laughs> subject, but let's approach it from a simple angle. An organization's structure, processes, and people should lead to the achievement of its strategic goals. So at the end of the day, I will I want to emphasize this again and again. We don't draw organizational charts. We don't create structures for the sake of creating structures. At the end of the day, it has to do with achieving the ultimate goals, the ultimate objectives, the ultimate vision of our organization. Okay. Um, it was this systems thinking that helped me to understand the purpose driven church by Pastor Rick Warren so well, because he pointed out that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the church is described as the body of Christ. So if the church is the body of Christ, then the church runs on systems, right? And he said, you can just build the system and the structures and just align them with the five major purposes of the church, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, um, missions and evangelism, and worship. And that was what we just did in this time. We just restructured and decided we were going to achieve excellence in those five areas. We saw where our weakness was, straight. We were strong in maybe like two of those areas, weak in three. We then made sure since then we put the most senior people in our system to head each of those areas. We call them teams. Then we have the strategic support, the finance, the HR, the IT, and so on, okay? At the end of the day, the structure should work towards the achievement of the strategic goals. However, the fast rate of disruption right now is making organizations to pivot often. You know what I mean? The pandemic happened, okay? There's inflation now, threat of a recession, and so on. Uh, big organizations closing shops, Bed Bath and beyond, since they're closing 150 of their shops. That's, those are huge changes going on, right? They are affecting the structure. So organizations are restructuring. Structures need to be flexible to allow for adaptability to change. I say that we've got to treat structures like clothes. And anyone who's bought clothes for children knows <laughs> what I'm talking about because they outgrow those clothes quickly, right? So parents, what do we do? You buy the next size. <laughs> So that you're not back in the shop in the next two months looking for clothes again, you buy the next size. Well, the shoe should not be too much oversized, okay? They used to put paper. Some parents used to put paper used to fill the space between your leg, your foot, and the shoe, right? So the organization, the structure should, should not be too tight, right? It, it should be, it should have enough space, have some boxes unoccupied so that people have space for moving, okay? And um, they say that the shoe should not tell the foot how big it should grow. Let the foot grow as big as it wants, okay? Then you get the size of the shoe that will fit it. Structure should be flexible. I wanna say though, with the kind of disruptions going on now, the flexibility that we need, the, some of the changes we need to carry out, you know, so that we're still alive <laughs> and growing into the future. 
Some of the changes we're carrying out require more than just changing lines and boxes. They require a redesign of the whole organization. It is difficult to add to an, an organization something that wasn't factored into its foundation. This is important because sometimes we leaders attend a conference like this, we learn something new, we're fired up, we're inspired, then we go back, we want to effect change. Most efforts like that fizzle out in a few weeks. First, if when this building was designed, it was designed to be the single family home, it, it is designed for, then suddenly we have a change of mind. We say we want to remove the roof and take it up to 10 stories. We want to bring some things in that were not provided for in the foundation so they don't work. That's why many change efforts don't work. If, if it was not, if the organization itself was not designed, to accommodate that thing that you saw somewhere else, saw in another business or in another church, if what you want to bring in was not designed in the first place, you may need to even go down to your foundation, tweak some things, redesign the whole organization for the change effort to work. Training and leading the people that will run the systems is critical to the success of any system or structure, the people part. I'll tell you as an organizational expert that it's the people part that is more complex. <laughs> the structure part, draw the lines, create the boxes, write the job description, the people part. So we need to pay attention to that. This is a leadership conference. And I'm saying, taking time to train the people that will run the systems is critical. Leadership development is critical. We must prioritize it. So when we created our structures, we created a training system to produce the people that will populate and run the systems and the structures. Systems increase our capacity for success exponentially. I remember finally something uh, Dr. David Oedepo said to me many years ago. He said, if you throw your clothes into your travel bag without folding them, said your travel bag won't take as many clothes as they will take if you folded each one neatly. Structure creates order. Order creates increase. Thank you. I pray in Jesus' name that God would give each of us wisdom, amazing wisdom. I pray God will give us wisdom to make the best decisions for our organizations in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Sam. Once again, you have succeeded in taking me back to school. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I took the teacher to school. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's what they said, continuous learning. You know, so you, you took me back to school and honestly, I really, really appreciate your presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we can only pray more grace for you, you know, in Jesus' name. Um, now is the time for us to go into some questions. And um, some of these questions uh, will be quite practical, we, we hope, um, so that we can, um, you know, um, know more concerning what you know you have taught us today. So if you are here to write in your questions, please send in your questions right away, right away, right away. Um, um, are, are you ready, Reverend Sam? Yes, I'm good to go. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the first question here, <laughs> very interesting. The, how do you ensure effective succession planning within an organizational structure? Okay, now. <laughs> 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 oh my I'm not, god i'm not saying anything though <laughs> this is the kind of a question i would expect last <laughs> very very good question very good question okay so succession planning is um what an organization does to ensure that it identifies critical roles which when they are not occupied, 
they affect the running of the organization adversely. So succession plan is the process through, through which an organization identifies those critical roles and then designs its leadership development program to ensure there are always people to occupy those critical roles. How should an organization go about it? I would say create a succession policy. Create a succession policy. Don't crack your head over it if you're not an HR specialist. Get professional help. And they will help you. They will take you through that process, you know, identifying what those critical roles are. Um, it, it reminds me of somebody I worked with many years ago. When I started uh, my broadcast on radio, Success Found. So one of the young men working with me was deputy creative director at one of the leading advertising agencies in Nigeria. And he told me that some of the jobs that they did for some companies, the companies would insist, they would put a clause in the agreement that the day the advertising agency allowed him to go, the contract would automatically cease. So his role was critical. So when you have people like that, you have to ensure that you train people you ensure transfer of knowledge. There's what we call, when it comes to knowledge, there's what we call explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge. The explicit one can be written down. Make, try and get people that occupy those critical roles to write down what they do and how they do them, not just what they do. That's job description, how the job is done. And then make sure that they also do mentoring and coaching. There are things you just you get by experience. They say those things cannot be taught, they can only be caught. But if, if people are insecure, if you don't walk towards it deliberately, people will carry such knowledge along with them and the day they go, they're gone. Uh, we had something like that in my office. My former personal assistant, well, he's moved on. <laughs> People grow in our organization. He's a doctor of strategic leadership like me. So he's founded his consulting firm and all that. He's starting a ministry. But when he was leaving, the big question was who was going to replace him? And I found that he had done something that was very good. He wrote down every single thing that is done in the senior pastor's office and how it is done. Gratefully, there was a young man there in the office. They did it together the young man just naturally took over from him. So that's what I would describe about succession plans. It's not something complicated. Let me mention though that most times when you say succession, it's only CEO succession that people think about. But I want to say when we think succession, we should think about it at all levels of the organization. It will make the CEO one easier because the longer people stay in the organization, the more likely they'll be able to play the CEO role. My goodness, that's that's a good one because uh, honestly, what your former PA did right. is not in our culture. And when I mean by our culture, you right. know, I'm talking about especially Nigerian culture, African right. culture, because when people leave positions, they want their living to be felt. Right. They want it to be regretted. You know, so there is no way they are going to teach somebody taking over from them what they do and how they've done it. Even if they do, they are not going to do it to the fullest. Mm. You know, they still believe you have to come back to say, oh, sorry, we missed you. We shouldn't have <laughs> left you go. Please, how do you open the door to the chairman's <laughs> office? <laughs> you know, so, 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 so your answer in itself, I believe it's it's a cultural shift mm. for somebody that is listening or watching us, you know, to, to be able to maybe write down and start to inculcate and demand, you know, in, in our various, you know, places of work and, and, and ministries. You know, thank you so much. Thank you so much. There's another question. The, in what ways can leaders stress test or access, you know, or assess rather the vulnerability of the, the structure 
of the organization. How can you access the vulnerability? You know, just to, to check it out. Is it is it as solid as it's supposed to be? I know in the case of a building, you know, when you know the foundation is weak, when you begin to see some lines on mm -hmm. the walls, you right. know, and you repair it and it comes up again, people tell you this may be a foundational issue. But in an organization, how do you do this? Right, right, right. So um, you're so right in the sense that, so I was taught something in my engineering class. That's right. why I use building because I know <laughs> you know that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> right, that when you see a crack, you know, it's either only on the superstructure or it goes down to the substructure. Okay, it's only either on the surface or it's deep. So when you fill it with poly, poly with a filler and you cover it with paint, if it stays, no more crack, you're fine. If it shows up again, you have to go way, way down, yeah. right? Um, I would say that um, we need for example, to move people, you know, per time. Because sometimes you're not sure whether it's the structure that is working or it's the person that is making things to work. So you want to make sure people go on leave, people go on vacation. You want to see what happens when they've gone on vacation. If things are going to fail, then it's the, the old structure is resting on the personality. It's not resting on principles. You may have to then change your approach to the training that you're doing and make sure uh, that the system is made to work. Uh, also, you want to check uh, the, the communication. Are you having communication issues or not? If there's a lot of confusion about who should be reporting to who, then there's a big problem. Um, when you bring in new hires, it's also absolutely important to see how they fit into the system within six months. I always encourage the engagement of new hires within the first six months that they come in because um, they see with new eyes. The people who've been there are used to the way things have been done. So I encourage therefore that they be engaged. In fact, in, in this data, for example, I give them direct line access. I tell them to bring things to my attention, not to frustrate the system, but because I know I'm dealing with a culture where the young people are not allowed to speak to elders or in the presence of elders, so they can be easily intimidated. Mm -hmm. So I allow for feedback. So those are the suggestions that I will give for checking how well the system is running. I encourage also sometimes just simple rotation just rotate people on their roads sometimes and see how well the system can stand. I know sometimes in, in some organizations you rotate, things just carry on smoothly because people know what the vision is, they know what the goals are, but more importantly, they know what the values are and they practice them. But if you have, in, uh, should I say, inconsistent culture, across the various units. When you rotate people like that, you'll see a measure of confusion in the process. Hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, before I let you go, I, I, I seriously have a burden for pastors and that's the truth. You know, all this started from my burden as, um, as a young pastor. Um, it took me a while to realize that there's a difference between a calling, you know, and leadership. Do you understand? Um, yeah. I want to ask you, please, um, what advice do you have for a pastor who is frustrated because of lack of structure? 
you know, or frustrated with, with ministry. You might not even know his lack of structure, you know, mm -hmm. but frustrated with ministry. And uh, there's no doubt that God has called him. There's no doubt that mm -hmm. God has called him. Uh, what advice do you have for them? Hmm. Thank you, Pastor Tola. Thank you for your empathy. Because the truth is that you have many pastors in that category. Um, many years ago, there was this data from the Banner Research Group. And they pointed out that 85% of churches in the US had less than 200 members. Now, this is post-pandemic, so many things have changed. But that was the statistic. And for me, it was shocking. And they were trying to find out what was the point? What was the difference? What is it? And they found out it was about this thing, you know, that the average pastor cannot personally manage more than 200 people effectively. That you visit them, you pray for them, you do that, you are the one that conducts the service, you do the preaching and all that. If you're very charismatic, you may be able to push it beyond that point. But at some point, you will burn out. And they said, the only way to scale it, to scale that growth barrier, is for you to take some of the 200 and to teach them everything you know and delegate the work to them. So let's say you take 20. Even if, let's say it's just 20 of the 200. You teach them so well, each of them can attract and manage 50 people each. 20 times 50 is 1,000. Why don't most people do it? It's hard. If you're a pastor and you really have genuine concern for people, you really love people, you want to serve them. You derive fulfillment from adding value to people, from praying for people, seeing them healed, seeing them get married, seeing them do this, you join them, and all you are there when they're happy, when they're when they're grieving, you are there for them. So the implication is that to jump that barrier, you will have to drop those things and watch other people do them. It's easy to say, it's hard to do. If I was discussing with the pastor yesterday and I said it's a John 12, 24 scenario. When Gentiles, Greeks, came in the crowd in Jerusalem and told the disciples of Jesus that they wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus was operating under the covenant of Abraham. He was only reaching the Jews. Gentiles, the season for Gentiles would be after his death and resurrection. When they told him, he said, hmm, except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains the way it is. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. So it was implying, I will reach the Gentiles, but not personally. I will read the Gentiles, but not personally. That would be the job of Paul the Apostle and other people. It's the same thing with pastoring. I tell people that when I had to shift beyond that point, that it was hard. I went everywhere in Lagos, naming babies, you know, entering people's homes, rejoicing with them, it was fulfilling. But I had to drop that. Wedding ceremonies, when we got it right like that, we delegated, you know, I conducted training for the whole church for seven and a half months. We created a new training system when we created a new structure. And one hour before service, I was training every Sunday for 30 weeks. And we were recording. And I was telling them, there's a crowd coming. There's no way I'm going to teach them. You guys are the ones that will train them. Apply what I'm teaching you so you have personal testimonies to share. Once I was done, we started all over. Then I took only four classes out of those 30. So, and as our people were taking the class, the church just exploded. Pastors need to know that shepherds don't give back to sheep. It is sheep that give back to sheep. Insisting on doing everything alone is Old Testament style. In the New Testament, our assignment is to train church members to actually do ministry work. So our church exploded, you know, when, when we did that, just delegated the ministry work to church members. Then the weddings exploded. Sometimes these days we conduct 10 weddings in one weekend, maybe two on Thursday. And on Saturday, we run weddings concurrently at two halls, in two halls, 
you know, and we can do four straight like that at each location. It's only for 50 minutes. <laughs> but the six months before, we do massive training. We told ourselves there is no need preaching long sermon to them on their wedding day. They won't hear you. It's the honeymoon they are thinking about, you know. So these are systems, structures. But I miss being at wedding ceremonies. I cannot attend uh, four wedding ceremonies on Saturday and still be preaching a very fine sermon on Sunday, Sunday. when there will be three, four services also, you know. Mm. So, so I don't meet highly placed people in the society who come to our church for the first time and all that. So I just want to say, I want to encourage the pastor who, who probably is even already experiencing burnout. I understand how it feels. I fell sick once. Eh? I took right in the middle of a service. I had to leave to go and stay in the office. When I sat on the chair, every bone in my body was hurt. I had to lay on the rug. When the service ended, it was all through the night. When the service ended, it was my wife that drove home. She sent for my doctor friend. The guy came. I said, he should take my blood. That what was happening to me had never happened before that I was afraid. He said, there's nothing. It's stress. I'm treating other pastors like you in my hospital. Ah, I said, it's serious. It's serious. Take my blood. <laughs> it was stress. So I want to say that I believe God with you that as we believe God for growth and expansion, that he will also give the wisdom for us to put those structures, delegate the assignment so there can be growth by God's grace. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I thought I was asking the question because I had a body. Only for the answer now to be speaking to me directly also. Ah. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Oh, my you God. Know, you know, I, 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 I love the, 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 the answer you gave. Not because I, I didn't know also, you know, uh, a lot of the things you've said is what we are practicing. But yes. like you said, it's very difficult because you are just a pastor. And once you are a pastor, your heart is with your people. You know, you want to rejoice with them. But I got to a point I had to say to in our church that, please, even if I do your wedding, don't expect me at the reception. You, know, <laughs> you, you can't, I can't be doing a buga at your reception on Saturday, and you want me to preach a good message on Sunday. I mean, right. He, 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 no, I said, please, because it's deliverance. Right. You understand? And I believe there are pastors who are listening today, just be delivered of it. Do you understand? Mm. You know, at times, some people see you in church, they don't say hi to you because you didn't come for something that they did over the weekend. I can't attend everything. I can't. Not at this stage. Not at this stage. You know, there was a time we used to do it and all that, but... Yeah. That time has passed, and that's just the truth, you know, and life is in stages, do you understand? Mm -hmm. So I want all the pastors to be encouraged that uh, it is well, use some wisdom, 